Good morning. Thank you uh, for the kind introduction. It's so nice to be here. Uh, I arrived at around 2.40 in the morning. My flight was delayed through Denver, but uh, I'm uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and I'm excited to be here to be talking about something I feel very passionately about. Uh, that's uh, ice hockey. No, I'm going to talk about CT for transcatheter valvular disease, Dr. Little. Um, my disclosures. I do have a number of disclosures that are salient to this talk, in particular that uh, while I don't derive personal financial benefit, we have uh, institutional core lab agreements with Medtronic, uh, supporting actually Dr. Reardon's uh, trial, who's on his way to, to ACC to present on uh, on Sertavi, uh, Edwards Life Sciences, uh, Neovas, Tendine, and Encora. Uh, I've also helped uh, develop software for the analysis of mitral valve uh, with circle cardiovascular imaging. So as I stand here in March uh, 2017, I thought, let's do a top 10 list of uh, ways CT can help for transcatheter mitral and uh, tricuspid interventions. And uh, because uh, I know that people don't want to be here through till 10 o'clock, uh, I thought I would truncate that to six. So I'm focusing on six ways that CT can really help. But before I go there, I wanted to talk about research that was done by someone else, not, not our work, but really to, to uh, start with a somewhat controversial topic, which is the adjudication of uh, mitral regurgitation severity. We've historically, of course, relied on uh, echocardiography for the adjudication of MR severity. It's the gold standard. It's a clinical tool most commonly used. But I think that there's quite... Um, at very least thought-provoking data that has come to us from, uh, from uh, Morristown, uh, New Jersey, from Linda Gillum's lab, or from Seth Uretsky, looking at the adjudication of MR severity. I know this is work that, that uh, the team here is looking at, looking at complex flow models to better understand quantification and, and uh, identification of patients who are likely to derive benefit from either surgical intervention or, for that matter, transcatheter intervention. And here I highlight data published in JAK back in 2015 by Seth Uretsky. And what you can see is, as a, as a humble CT imager, uh, rather sobering data when we look at the uh, confirmation of the diagnosis of severe mitral insufficiency, the very disease process that these novel devices are attempting to uh, treat, uh, at least by reducing mitral insufficiency, whether that even treats functional mitral regurgitation is another whole story. But at very least, we want to make sure someone has severe MR if you're going to actually treat their MR. Uh, and you can see when you look at the uh, correlation between MR and echo when it comes to those with graded severe disease, there's very poor uh, agreement. And if you look at the downstream effect of the surgical intervention, which is what Seth looked at, he essentially did uh, pre-surgical pre intervention MRI and echo, and then followed those patients with imaging after uh, using MR uh, and echo. And what you could see is that the relationship between the end diastolic volume uh, after surgery is very tight, is, quite, is really quite tight for MR-predicted severe uh, uh, for MRI predicted severe mitral regurgitation, but poorly correlates with um, echocardiographic adjudication of severe uh, MR, suggesting that perhaps, owing to the limitations of the, uh, the confident grading of uh, mitral insufficiency using, using echocardiography, that we may, may be taking patients for surgical or transcatheter interventions who are unlikely to derive a clinical benefit. Um, and so if we look at that as well, uh, when we look at the severity of MR by CMR, a lot of these patients, when we had, were adjudicated with uh, MRI, were not found to have uh, severe mitral insufficiency and did not have the expected hemodynamic response of LV remodeling and reduction of end diastolic volume. So this is a bit controversial discussion, but I think fodder for prospective randomized trial to look at uh, downstream clinical outcomes when determining the need for, for uh, surgical intervention for mitral insufficiency uh, uh, on the base of MRI versus echocardiography. But let's focus on the stuff that we've really been uh, spending a lot of time on the last two, three years, and that's using CT to help us understand not only uh, the pathophysiology of mitral insufficiency, the anatomical remodeling of mitral insufficiency, but also the patient-specific uh, uh, evaluation uh, of, uh, of patients prior to transcatheter mitral valve interventions. So the first thing that I, I would highlight is that MDCT, as an anatomical test, it doesn't have the temporal resolution of echocardiography, we don't have hemodynamics, but as an anatomical test, MDCT allows for a granular and clear definition of the mitral annulus. 
when I started doing CT for the mitral annulus, I thought to myself, well, I'll use these manual multiplanar reformats and I'll reconstruct the mitral plane. The issue with this, of course, is that the mitral annulus is a non-planar structure. So if you use simple two-dimensional uh, multiplanar oblique tools, you'll be able to get a short axis of what you think is the mitral annulus, but in fact that won't correlate very well with a saddle-shaped annulus first defined by Dr. Levine back in 1989. In addition, I would posit to you that if you use these techniques, especially given the non-planarity of the annulus, you're unlikely to be reproducible. And as one of my mentors told me, you can never be accurate if you're not reproducible, and particularly if you're guiding an intervention. My interventionists don't care if I'm right, because who knows what right is? Right is a moving target. Right is going to be very different in 10 years than it was 10 years ago. And that's something we all have to accept in medicine. What we have to do is be reproducible, and we have to know and learn how to integrate our numbers into decision-making around procedures that informs decisions that improve clinical outcomes. So we have to be reproducible, and I think that's all that, I mean, Dr. Reardon has said to me, uh, John Webb at my site, can they take those numbers to the bank? Do they know what they mean, and are they consistent? So for the learners in the audience, which uh, I know we all are at all times, uh, that the mitral annulus is non-planar. Uh, that was first described uh, using a very... Uh, impressive, uh, uh, um, through an impressive amount of work by Bob Levine back in 1989 when 3D, 3D echo wasn't simply putting a probe and clicking a button, but ra rather a very manual approach that defined the, the saddle-shaped configuration of the mitral annulus, defined by the nadirs at the uh, mitral trigones, the fibrous trigones, and then sloping up to the aortic root. As I mentioned, this whole notion that accuracy is not possible with reproducibility is what drove us towards a somewhat elaborate but uh, highly reproducible segmentation of the mitral annulus. This is, uh, this is available through a number of vendors now, uh, through Mencio, Circle, and a number of other people are working on it. Through this process, we can literally train someone in less than an hour to identify uh, the, uh, the insertion point to the mitral valve leaflets to be able to define the saddle-shaped mitral annulus. And the software essentially rotates once you define the center point of the mitral valve all the way around and you deposit points uh, all the way around the mitral, uh, at, at the mitral uh, valve insertion, it will actually generate a non-planar saddle-shaped annulus, again, defined by the uh, mural leaflet attachment here at the uh, mitral annulus, the junction of the atrial and ventricular myocardium. Here you can see a bit of a posterior shelf, which is one of the hallmarks of functional mitral insufficiency, secondary to the left ventricular dilatation. The trigones, which are going to be defined at the nadir immediately before the LVOT starts to identify, a very clear standard operating procedure for identification of the uh, trigones, and then the anterior peak. The issue is, well, a couple of issues. When we started doing this, I realized, you know, it, it may be anatomically correct that the mitral annulus is saddle-shaped, that there's the trigones and then it scoops up to the aortic peak. But the reality is in Vancouver, when we would image patients post-mitral uh, uh, annuloplasty, uh, surgical annuloplasty, I never saw a saddle-shaped annuloplasty ring. And you talk to the surgeons and they'd say, well, you know, I know what you're talking about, about all this fancy anterior peak business, but I put in a ring and I get out of there and I reduce the mitral insufficiency. The other issue with this whole saddle-shaped approach is that while it, again, may be hemodynamically relevant and, and for that matter, anatomically correct, if you were to size a device on the base of the saddle-shaped annulus, the implications for the patient would be that you would almost certainly obstruct the left ventricular outflow tract. So if you took a saddle-shaped annulus and said that the mitral annulus is non-planar, but I'm going to use, I'm going to project the area of the saddle-shaped non-planar uh, annulus to a single two-dimensional plane because the device itself is going to have to be planar. It's not, uh, it's unlikely to be saddle in its shape you're going to almost certainly obstruct the left ventricular outflow tract, which even as a radiologist struck me as a, as a bad idea. Um, so that led us to, uh, in 2014, propose, uh, not that it was rocket science, it just seemed like it needed to be the case, that we'd actually, if we're going to size the device, we need to size it in accordance not to the saddle-shaped annulus, but to the de-saddled uh, or the D-shaped annulus with truncation of the mitral annulus at the level of the fibrous trigones. 
The nice thing with this is that the fibrous trigones can be consistently identified using um, methodology that is, again, very highly reproducible and very, very standardized, such that you could take 10 readers in this room and by, by noon we could be identifying the, uh, the trigones in a consistent fashion, allowing us to generate a D-shaped annulus defined by the trigones anteriorly with an intercommissural uh, or a CC line defined through the centroid of the mitral annulus and then an A2 to P2 or septal to lateral distance. Sorry, the, uh, the reference is cut off. This is Nayum et al. last year uh, in Jack Imaging. We looked at uh, the D-shaped annulus in normals and in patients with mitral valve prolapse and functional mitral insufficiency. And what we can see here is that the mitral annulus is roughly 8.5 centimeters squared by area or 9 centimeters squared in normals. And it's significantly larger in those with FMR, not surprisingly, particularly driven by an increase in the septal to lateral distance. That's, that's, that, that is, in fact, what's driving, of course, the insufficiency in that case. But interestingly, the mitral annulus is substantially larger in cases of prolapse, which may reflect disjunction. Uh, or other things, but nonetheless, defining an understanding of how this D-shaped annulus relates to disease states and uh, uh, perhaps then uh, enabling us to inform device sizing. Importantly, this D-shaped approach is not only theoretical, but it actually has confirmational similarities to the post-implant appearances of these transcatheter mitral valve devices. So. For those of you who are not familiar, there are a number of devices that have now been implanted, I believe seven or eight in, in humans. There are a number of approaches, transcatheter approaches to mitral insufficiency, including uh, 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 transcatheter annuloplasty uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, mitroclip, obviously, but also frank replacement of the valve. Most of these valves up until now have been deployed transapically, but are now being deployed transeptally. And here you can see a tiara device, which has a uh, a D-shaped configuration, allowing it to be with its, uh, with its uh, D configuration pointing laterally, protective of the and respectful of the uh, left ventricular outflow tract. So how do these measurements correlate with 3D TEE? At least in our lab, we found that the D-shaped annulus on CT correlates quite well with 3D TE. One of the advantages, therefore, is similar to uh, CT prior to TAVR, is that even if you elect to use transesophageal echocardiography at the time of the procedure, which obviously in the mitral, uh, given the, the newness of the mitral procedure and the importance of, uh, of deployment, uh, TE is essential. Uh, but it avoids the need for a repeat TEE in advance of the procedure by being able to size the device and characterize the mitral annulus in a reproducible fashion with CT that correlates well with uh, 3D TEE without a systematic uh, bias. Here you can see the three-dimensional TEE images from uh, our echo lab. The second way we use CT in advance of transcatheter mitral valve interventions, whether they're being evaluated for mitroclip or cardioband, which is an annuloplasty device, or tiara or tendine or, or cardiac Q, which are transcatheter mitral valve devices, is to understand the, the, the anatomical landing zone. Again, CT is an anatomical test. It provides elegant anatomical information. And all of these transcatheter mitral valve devices have different mechanisms of both capture and sealing. Capture, for example, for the historic, uh, for the um, Neovast device relies on uh, these tabs. These tabs then engage on the anterior mitral valve leaflet, uh, but also on this posterior shelf, which is a hallmark of functional mitral insufficiency. That's why this device is primarily focused on FMR or secondary uh, mitral insufficiency. Whereas the paddles and the historical Fortis device, then we see the barbs for the cardiac Q, which is the new device. Uh, acquired by Edwards, and then the uh, Tendine device, which was published in JAK, uh, the feasibility trial, which is now undergoing uh, larger uh, uh, validation in a, in a, in a um, pivotal trial in the United States, which relies on a neocord that somewhat remodels the left ventricular apex and tethers the device at the apex. So here you can see when we're evaluating patients for the, for the Neovas device where this posterior sh shelf is relevant, you start seeing that in normals, if you look at a normal coronary CT, you'll see that the atrial and ventricular myocardium form a straight line. Whereas in this case, in the setting of a non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, you start forming this posterior shelf as the ventricle bows, and of course that results in uh, tenting of the posterior leaflet and, and uh, suboptimal coaptation of the mitral valve. Uh, and you can appreciate that we can uh, identify this posterior shelf not just in diastole, 
but also in Sicily, and in this case, a much larger shelf in the setting of a mature circ territory infarct. You can see the remodeling, thinning in the infralateral wall, large posterior shelf preserved in, in Sicily as well. This would be a good landing zone for a neovast tiara device. We can also characterize the landing zone beyond this posterior shelf. We can identify things like mitral annular disjunction, which uh, when we uh, first uh, identified on CT a few years ago, I was very excited. I thought I actually discovered something, and then I found in 1987 it was published in the New England Journal. So I was, I was late only by 28 years, really. It's a rounding error. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we can see disjunction on CT as well. Apparently, they can see it pathologically and could in the 80s, and certainly I know you can see it on echocardiography. But nonetheless, an important finding, and I think many people who read cardiac CT see this finding and struggle with what it in fact is, but it's atrialization of the posterior mitral annulus, and this is common in, in fibroelastic defi deficiency or mitral valve uh, prolapse. Calcium, if you're reading coronary CT, you know that calcium is one of the Achilles heel of coronary CT because calcium is so uh, obvious that it sometimes can obscure the lumen. On the other hand, if it's your Achilles heel, it can also be a strength when it comes to uh, anatomical evaluation of the mitral annulus. Uh, we can see calcium very well. We can characterize calcium, be it caseous or otherwise. Is it protruding? Is it nodular? Uh, and so on. We know that calcium is varied in its distribution. It's most frequently seen in P1 and P2 in mitral valve prolapse. Uh, it's not uncommon. And then what we need to do over time is we need to learn how to characterize this landing zone uh, uh, calcification to understand how much calcium is too much for these devices. How much calcium uh, uh, will the device tolerate given the self-expanding lower radial force? Will it actually co-apt? Will it result in paravalvular regurgitation? We know that paravalvular regurgitation in the mitral position is uh, far more sinister than in the aortic uh, and the, the risks associated with of, uh, profound hemolysis and uh, deterioration. So when we look at calcium, what I always say uh, is that we need to be consistent. When we look at the aortic position, this is something we struggled with for a long time. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I know this lab here, Stephen is uh, uh, leading a lot of this personalized approach using 3D modeling, and I think that ultimately is the answer. But if we look at it on a crude level, just trying to understand patient-specific anatomy, what I believe is that we have to be consistent in our approach. Again, when we look at the aortic valve, People used to, when we started doing this for the aortic, we used to see people scoop inside this big nodule of calcium when they would measure the annulus, or they would go outside. Or some people would say, you know, I'm a Canadian, I like to arbitrate things with, uh, with uh, you know, no make, don't make a decision, don't offend anyone, so I'm going to go right through the middle of this calcium. But, okay, well, what's right? I don't know what's right, but the problem with that is you've got three answers. So, you know, if you're Neil Kleinman or you're, you're Mike Reardon and you say, okay, well, Dr. Little gives me, he gives it to me this way, depending if he's had his coffee, and then if he's had his coffee, hasn't had his coffee, he gives a different number, and if Sumin gets this case, then he gives me a different number. So now I have to go look at the image, because I have no idea how they measure this. This cannot work, right? So what we've said is that we need to pursue harmony, and that is define the annular contour as if it was, as if the calcium wasn't present. You go to the LVOT, you come up to the root of the aorta, you ignore the calcium. You measure the annulus. Then you comment about this large protruding nodule of calcium that may drive paravalvular regurgitation, that may drive annular, risk, uh, annular rupture risk, but you need to be consistent. Similarly here, this calcium, do you suddenly scoop outside it? What we say is you just follow the annular contour and ignore it. And so that's what we're trying to do. You know, I know Myra Guerrero, who's now with uh, Ted Feldman in, uh, in Evanston, is really interested in transcatheter sapiens and mitral valve disease, and how do we... How do we measure this mitral annular calcium? No one knows right now, but I think in order to understand how to do it, we're going to have to define what we're going to do, measure it consistently, and then link it to clinical outcomes. And then by linking it to clinical outcomes, we can understand how we need to alter or modify those uh, measurements, or ultimately, if the measurements don't inform decision making and you simply have to do advanced modeling, be it three-dimensional or, or computationally uh, CFD or something along those lines. But what we say is we maintain the annular contour, we ignore the calcium to try and be highly reproducible to determine its clinical value. The third reason we use uh, CT is for coplanar angle prediction. 
We've been doing this for the aortic position in a semi-automated fashion for many, many years. You know that uh, based on not only our experiences in the aortic position, but beyond that, this very nice paper from the McGill group showing us that any anatomical structure in the heart that we can segment, of course, if it exists in a three-dimensional and two-dimensional space, we can generate coplanar angles uh, or angles that are coplanar based on the Im image intensifier and the fluoroscopic uh, machine. So that if we look at uh, the aortic root, we have a typical RAO caudal extending LAO cranial with a fairly uh, gradual slope. On the other hand, the mitral annulus is a very steep slope, typically RAO caudal extending uh, very rapidly into a cranial position still on the RAO side. Uh, and then the left atrial appendage, uh, and then the atrial septum for the transeptal uh, puncture. So anything you segment, you can generate a coplanar curve, which can help inform the proceduralist at the time of the procedure. So these are virtual uh, fluoro, uh, LV grams. These are done from CT, uh, and this is actually from 3 Mencio. And what you can see is we can generate angles by superimposing the D-shaped mitral annulus. We can generate angles that are coplanar to the CC, uh, CC line, which are commonly desired but rarely achievable. You can see so profoundly RAO, profoundly caudal. On the other hand, the septal to lateral A2P2 is very achievable but not as desirable. That's the way life goes, of course. Uh, so what we do is we provide this compromise view, typically um, RAO 25, which is the acceptable threshold, you know, where our proceduralists feel generally comfortable with. And that will allow the proceduralists to provide, uh, it will be on the, uh, we provide the angle that is corresponding with regards to the caudal tilt that will be then allow the coplanar projection of the mitral annulus. We'll also provide the proceduralists an on-fast view. That's typically way off the uh, co uh, line of coplanarity for the mitral annulus, but will allow the proceduralist to angle her hands, let's say, in, along the plane of the, uh, that will allow a really uh, a perpendicular trajectory towards the mitral annulus, mimicking uh, this, uh, this uh, on-fast projection. What we also do is we segment the coronary sinus. When we first saw these uh, procedures being done, what, we, what I saw was the surgeon and John Webb uh, putting in a coronary sinus wire. And I said, okay, well, John, why do you have a coronary sinus wire there? And he said, well, it's a fluoros fluoroscopic landmark to the mitral annulus. So we went back to our CTs and we looked at them and we realized what I thought was the case is that the coronary sinus has an inconsistent relationship to the P2 you know, posterior mitral valve annulus. Sure, it's there, it's posterior to it, but in some people it's within five millimeters, in some people it's three centimeters. So by segmenting the coronary sinus and then projecting it on the, on the, uh, on the monitor in the hybrid OR, when they put in the coronary sinus wire, they understand then where that wire should be in relation to the mitral annulus for that individual patient, rather than uh, just assuming that it's in a consistent uh, position across all patients, which is, uh, in fact, a, a somewhat flawed assumption. How about LVOT obstruction? Uh, we know that coronary occlusion, annular rupture, these are the most feared complications of TAVR. One of the most feared complications of transcatheter mitral interventions is going to be obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract. Uh, and the mechanisms are obviously uh, broad and, uh, uh, and still being sorted, but a small LVOT, a septal bulge, device flaring, canting of the device, residual systolic function, all of these things can result in uh, increased gradient across the LVOT. But one thing that we think is helpful, and again, it comes back to 3D modeling and, and uh, really ultimately providing the definitive answer, but to start just to use CT to screen out patients where you wouldn't even model them because their anatomy looks so, uh, uh, so uh, egregious for a transcatheter mitral valve device is this concept of the neo-LVOT. If you look in the native uh, situation, the LVOT is a fairly long structure. Uh, it's defined by the anterior mitral valve leaflet and the basal septum. When you simulate a device, what happens, of course, is the anterior mitral valve leaflet is displaced anteriorly, and then you define this neo-LVOT based on the path of the flow of blood that is now distorted by that transcatheter mitral valve device. Now, uh, one of the limitations of this is that we, are, we have no way of being certain what's going to happen when you put in the device with regards to the loading conditions, the hemodynamics, the improvement in systolic function, nor for that 
excuse me, matter the, um, the, the variability of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. But nonetheless, we can integrate some of these, uh, these potential risks, whether it's the aortic mitral angulation, the device flaring, and the septal bulge, which are in fact known phenomenon, and develop images such as this. Um, this uh, here you can see uh, for a tendine device, you can uh, put in an STL file, or what we're doing here is learning from post-implant imaging to understand what is going to happen to this patient when you put in this device. And you can see that the LVOT went from this, which was of course wide with blood coming right up the middle, this is the native situation, and then following the deployment of a tendine transcatheter mitral valve, we see narrowing of this LVOT and this point of max uh, minimal uh, diameter or area seen at this level, uh, and we can actually provide that measurement either virtually by a, a virtual pre-implant uh, measurement or now post hoc by looking at the residual neo-LVOT to then correlate with post-implant hemodynamics to understand what threshold confers risk. So here's an example. In this case, I don't show you an STL file just because uh, obviously for proprietary reasons, but what I show you here is just a mimicked virtual sapien device uh, in a native position. This clearly wouldn't work in the absence of calcium because the annulus would be too big for a, for a sapien device. But you could see we, we deploy a sapien device virtually by clicking a button. We can offset it into the atrium or, or leave it right at the mitral annulus. And then we define a center line defined by the path of the flow of blood between the septum and the, the transcatheter virtual device. And we have then just simply drag our cursor along perpendicular to that center line and the path of the flow of blood, and then we have the neo-LVOT both in diastole and systole, and we report on that number. Right now we use 1.5 centimeters squared, which is extrapolated from HCM as a threshold for risk. Of course, uh, you know, people say, you know, so do you say you shouldn't do this procedure? I'm a non-invasive imager. I never tell someone to do or not to do a procedure. It's obviously their patient and their call, but at least we think that there's an increased risk of that procedure should the neo-LVOT be below 1.5 centimeters squared. Again, static, crude, but at least moving the needle a little bit uh, as we wait for more elegant solutions from places like this. Um, here's an example, though, where you don't need a more elegant solution. You know, this patient was being evaluated to relieve mitral stenosis in the setting of severe MAC. They said, can you do a CT? We do a CT. We, we, they suggested they were going to put in a 26 millimeter sapien device, which we simply through the click of a button. I don't know. They, the proceduralists say it's so hard. I just click a button. I get a valve in there, and I never have a complication. But what you could see, <laughs> so easy. No bleeding, nothing. Uh, but what happens here is you could see that uh, had I done this, uh, well, had I even punctured the groin, it would have been trouble. But had the proceduralists done this, uh, I would have predicted, or our CT predicted, that this patient would not have done well. If you look here, that even in diastole, there's barely any room whatsoever. Systole is clearly a conservative time point because most of the blood is left the ventricle, so it's very conservative. But even di in the diastolic measurement, there's very little room here at all in the neo-LVOT. So the likelihood of a, a fairly profound LVOT gradient is high, uh, and so the patient was uh, declined. And, and you can, uh, you know, there was ways of predicting this even before. You can appreciate the ventricle is small, the, aor the mitral aortic angle angulation is steep, uh, and it's a very um, hyperdynamic ventricle, which uh, fits with the, uh, the fact that the patient had mitral stenosis, not mitral insufficiency. The fifth way we use CT for uh, transcatheter mitral valve interventions is for uh, access localization. I had a junior colleague join me a couple of years ago and, from Germany, and he said, Jonathan, I think we, we can help them with their apex localization. And I said, you know, Philip, they've been doing transapical uh, uh, tabbies in uh, St. Paul's for 10 years. They were the first site to, in fact, do them. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be so arrogant as to tell them how to access the, uh, the uh, left ventricular apex. But fortunately, he's six foot six in Germany. He says, well, I'll be that arrogant. So uh, he said that we can actually do better. And he was right. And the reason he was right is that when it comes to the aortic position, you don't have to be that precise when it comes to getting the apex. But if you're going to go through the apex or through the ventricle towards the mitral, what you want to do is make sure that you're uh, perpendicular to the mitral valve, uh, mitral annulus, to make sure you don't cant the device and you don't have paravalvular regurgitation or LVOT gradient. And what you can see is that if you simply look at the uh, true apex, which I know they don't, they don't puncture, but even if they just offset a little bit, they're going to come into the mitral annulus in a very um, oblique fashion. Uh, 
the likelihood that you can be perpendicular over that short trajectory is very low. Whereas what we can do is by defining the center of the mitral valve, what we can do is then extend out in a perpendicular fashion and define a new access point that we think is uh, useful to uh, help uh, make the procedure easier and uh, uh, more effective. And we can project that then on the volume rendered image of the heart uh, and uh, localize that based on the, uh, the, uh, the, the anatomical uh, definition of the ribs and provide that guidance for the procedure. So that's coming out next month in JCCT. And what you can see here is, again, this is continuous improvement uh, rather than perfection. I don't expect that anyone is going, well, who knows if we're going to be doing transapical devices in the future. I highly uh, doubt it. But as we are doing them, as until we move towards a transeptal approach, we think this is a helpful way of at least identifying not patients with subtle differences, but patients where there could be substantive change in, in, uh, in access point localization. The sixth way we use CT is, of course, for thrombus detection. Uh, a lot of this, sorry, I don't know why that's cut off. Uh, a lot of interest, and in, uh, there'll be a late breaker presented by Raj Makar from Cedars at ACC uh, with the Copenhagen group looking at outcomes on 900 patients. We've had experience working with a group from, uh, uh, from Aarhus, Denmark, as well as a group from Bad Krotzingen in Germany looking at leaflet thickening. So for those of you who are unaware of this, what we saw uh, using CT post-implant uh, following transcatheter aortic valve replacement is, an is, is, an, is a, a fairly significant burden of leaflet thickening incidentally identified. Anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of patients who had post-implant CT on latest generation scanners were found to have thickened leaflets. This, is, this held true also for surgical aortic valves. The question is what, of course, does it mean? Should, it, should these patients be anticoagulated? Is it a marker of risk for stroke? Is it a marker of early structural valve degeneration? Here you can see a very similar appearing meniscoid-like area of thickening in a surgical bioprosthesis. What we know to date, at least, and it's going to evolve perhaps in two days, as mentioned, is that leaflet thickening does appear to be thrombus. It's an early reaction, whether it's a collagen injury or whether it's an inflammatory response to the native valve. It appears to be slightly more common in transcatheter heart valves in the aortic position than surgical valves. It's way more common in the mitral position without speaking out of turn, not shockingly because of a lower flow state and all the tissue that's present. And we do know that it resolves on anticoagulation and in patients who developed it, it often comes back uh, when you stop anticoagulation. But the real outstanding question is, up until now, we haven't found a meaningful link with, with uh, stroke. We saw a slight signal in the New England Journal paper published by Raj back in 2015 uh, when it came to TIAs, but these were site adjudicated TIAs. It was not, it was not uh, and it didn't predict stroke. In a larger cohort in Denmark, they very much saw no signal for neurovascular events at 30 days. So the real outstanding questions are, why do some patients develop leaflet thickening? Why is it 10 to 14 percent of patients? Why, why is this happening in both the surgical and uh, transcatheter valves? And is it important? Does it start the progression towards early structural valve degeneration? Uh, is, there, is it a building block where one develops thrombus and then fibrin and then calcium prematurely? Or does it not matter at all? And those are the questions that we're trying to answer, for example, as part of the low-risk a Medtronic trial, which is led by Dr. Reardon, who's on his way to, to, uh, to uh, ACC, where patients who are being randomized to surgery or TAVI are undergoing CT. We need to get more of those CTs. We're the core lab for that. And what we're going to do is look at the natural history of patients who have post-implant CT after TAVI, those with thickening and those without, and try to understand if those patients are, are uh, going to develop earlier structural valve degeneration. I think it is an opportunity. When we first saw this leaflet thickening, the field was very aggravated by this, of course, because they thought we just opened Pandora's box. And it's true, Pandora's box was open, but I think there is an opportunity. And the reason I think there's an opportunity is if you look at this work from um, uh, Joseph Prodez and Philippe Pivereau from uh, Quebec, they showed us that f uh, uh, roughly 5% of patients have early structural valve degeneration following TAVI. Um, uh, in, in, and that's, that's defined by rising uh, mean transvalvular gradients. So you can imagine if 5 to 7 percent have early structural valve degeneration and 14 percent have leaflet thickening, uh, 
it would be interesting to imagine if we could find those, those patients who are going to develop structural valve degeneration and if those patients are more likely to be of those patients who, who had early leaflet thickening. The final question is, once you've identified leaflet thickening, is it too late to stop that process? Do you have to prevent that leaflet thickening before it happens? As you can tell, I'm, I have no answers, a lot of questions, but I think an important idea or important topic. And finally, in the last five or seven minutes, you, you can imagine that as we move to the pulmonic space, as we move to the tricuspid space, that CT will provide us elegant information to help uh, device selection, device sizing, also in the tricuspid space. The field on the tricuspid side is even more complicated. Here you could see the Forma device, which is a spacer, which we uh, helped uh, the initial uh, uh, work with, published in Jack, lead author from from the group from Quebec uh, in uh, last year. Uh, that's from Edwards. We can see the use, uh, and this is largely being driven by Jörg Hausleiter and others, the use of the mitroclip on the tricuspid side. So these are leaflet uh, uh, techniques to reduce tricuspid insufficiency. We have d devices that reduce annular dimension, the mitraline device, that's work from Scott Lim and uh, and Becky Hahn and, and the groups from Germany. The tri-cinch device, which is a very interesting device, which involves putting a cinch and essentially uh, and tethering in the cava and pulling back on the tricuspid annulus to try and improve coaptation. And then these caval implants, which are obviously, uh, what's the word we use? Um, they're not curative, but rather, yeah, I forgot since I arrived at 3 in the morning, but either way, you uh, understand what I mean. It's not curing the tricuspid insufficiency, but it's preventing the deleterious effects of, of regurgitation. Palliative, that's the word. Um, procedural success is varied to date. This is data from the, uh, the first experience uh, with, uh, with the Forma device. And you can see that you uh, see an improvement in quality of life. A modest improvement in a six minute walk test, varied uh, improvement in tricuspid insufficiency. We have hemodynamic experts here much more than I. I'm a simple anatomical imager, but for those of you that do echo, you can appreciate that obviously loading conditions drive so much of the, uh, the tricuspid insufficiency. But nonetheless, uh, some signal that we're actually helping patients who are otherwise suffering. We use CT, uh, we use MR and CT to quantify uh, uh, RV volumes to help guide uh, the need for intervention. Uh, clearly, MR is an important tool for quantification. We see, I see Dr. Shaw here, so I'm sure you use a lot of MR for valvular quantification. Uh, we use CT. This is, uh, this is uh, work that needs to be grossly simplified, work that we submitted to SCCT, one of former fellows. I don't know, he went a little bit crazy on what we can measure on the tricuspid annulus, and uh, he calls it the Vitruviogram. Uh, essentially, he's measuring everything possible on the, uh, on the tricuspid annulus, but we can, of course, segment the tricuspid annulus in a reproducible fashion. We can generate coplanar angles. These are relevant for the Forma device. The Forma device is a spacer that's placed within the non-coapting uh, leaflets of the tricuspid valve and has a grasper that uh, then inserts on the uh, RV septum. Uh, and what you want to be able to do is look down the barrel on both the tricuspid annulus as well as the device. And of course, we can generate that. We can also provide apex localization in a fashion similar to the mitral position, and we can also then provide a coplanar, uh, or sorry, an orthogonal view to the actual tricuspid annulus, which allows you to then watch the device as it's coming right at you um, uh, on the fluoroscope. So in conclusion, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. I hope you found that of interest. Clearly, CT, uh, I think, uh, has asserted itself as a primary tool not only for transcatheter aortic work, but now as we see the evolution of transcatheter devices and interventions into uh, complex structural heart disease, and in particular into valvular disease, we will no longer have to build the case for the role of CT, but rather CT in the very early days will play an important role and is playing an important role in the device sizing, device selection, and procedural guidance. So thank you again for the opportunity.